Um, just F. Okay, now we're being now we're being recorded. Okay, so just FYI, um, that's an example of of what we do. I would not venture to make that decision about whether or not we would record this. this the, those are collective decisions, and everybody has input. So. Um, with that introduction to our workshop today, I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself and then call on the next person. As I said, my name is Anita Rios and I am um, one of the members of the Council of Caucuses. I'm also um, a founding member of the Diversity Committee. The Diversity Committee is one of the oldest committees that in existence. It, 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 I, I think it was um, created around the same time that we created the National Committee. And it was created primarily by people of color. And it was because as with um, most situations, we came into the Green Party being an only or one of very few. And um, we, we believe that Diversity mm -hmm. is the key Tomorrow to. We've got doctors all day long. Uh, can we all be muted until we are asked to, until our turn comes up? Thank you. Okay, so um, we decided to create a diversity committee because we feel that diversity is the key to success for our party. And we also feel that diversity is the key to success for humanity. We feel that without us figuring out how to um, coexist together with all our differences, because there is going to be differences. If we don't figure out how to coexist with all our differences, uh, we will continue to destroy the earth. We will continue to, to destroy each other. So um, it, with that, um, I would also um, share a little bit about the Latinx caucus. Um, so I am also a founding member of the Latinx caucus and I'm currently the secretary. I was the co-chair for a number of years um, and uh, our our other representative is Manuel Pintado, but he is ill right now and could not participate in this workshop. So um, we are always looking for new members and we are looking for participation. We want ideas. We know that there are many things happening in our community, our Latinx community that is very, very broad and not at all homogeneous that um, that we need to address and that we need to address through green solutions and figure out what that is, what that means to find green Latinx solutions to some of the problems that our communities face. So having said that, I am going to um, tag the next person to speak and that next person is going to be Cynthia Bryan Kate, who is, wait, wait, Sorry, I forgot something. I am going to introduce all the panelists so that you have some idea of who is going to be speaking. And then I will call on Cynthia Bryan Kate. So Cynthia Bryan Kate is the representative from the Forming Diversity, um, uh, excuse me, Disability Caucus. Um, we also have Galen Tyler, who is a longtime worker with the Poor People's Human Rights Campaign. And Galen is um, a representative from the Forming Poor People's Caucus. In addition, we have Daryl Moak, who is with the National Black Caucus. And we have Holly Hart, who is a representative from the Women's Caucus. And um, David Strand, who is a representative from the Lavender Caucus, and Jim Beckland, who is a representative from the Forming Elder Caucus. So again, my apologies for leaving that out and I uh, will pass it on to Cynthia Bryan Kate. Go ahead, Cynthia. Hi everyone. Uh, yes, my name is Cynthia Bryan Kate. I'm here representing the Forming Disability Caucus. Uh, I happen to be visually disabled, legally blind, which is why I'm, uh, you may have wondered why my eye contact is kind of all over the place. That's why. Besides, I'm using iPad to do this for the first time. I've been on other panels 
all weekend over an iPhone as held at a dirty uh, Blair Witch Project kind of angle. Okay. Uh, I've been involved in uh, basically civil rights, political diversity work for my entire life. I am also a member of the diversity committee of this party. And I'm involved in all that while there are other areas of my life that also that, that also fall under this, because I'm also on the Women's Caucus, the Lavender Caucus, uh, the Forming Poor People's Caucus. Uh, but the first reason that I've ever had to be politically active has been because I'm disabled and because I've had to fight for my rights as my family have had to help me fight for my rights when I was growing up. Pretty much in this country, we still need to have equality and dignity for disabled people, and that includes disabled Greens. Even though it's been 32 years since the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed, we still have barriers to access, which I spoke about on a panel on Friday afternoon. We still have many areas of civil liberties and rights that need to be worked on. And uh, a, I believe that one of the definitions of an identity caucus in this party is that it represents people who are marginalized and oppressed demographics. And there are still businesses that try discriminating against disabled people. There are still politicians who try that. It's one of the reasons why this party has been active, which I'm proud of, in uh, working as much as we can to expand rights and redress wrongs done regarding disability. I happen to be a vice chair of the Green Party of Suffolk, as in Suffolk County, Long Island, where I'm currently sitting with my iPad. And I can say that my party has been a leader on this particular issue in the area. I can say that 50% of our executive board are all disabled Greens. And in terms of intersectionality, this affects pretty much everybody somewhere, somehow. Uh, the caucuses that represent uh, people on ethnic and racial diversity, the Black Caucus, the Latinx Caucus, uh, the Forming Indigenous Caucus, well, we have disabled people of all sorts of racial and ethnic backgrounds. And unfortunately, the oppression and discrimination when it happens often happens along the uh, lines of the bigots uh, go bigot against every uh, you know demographic they can and try to get as many in one shot as they can. So people who are disabled and have any other diversity going on have to also fight for uh, dignity rights on all of that. In fact, this was talked about on the uh, intersex and gender uh, uh, spectrum workshop that I was on last night. Uh, disability does not uh, have any set age it belongs to. So both the Forming Elders Caucus and the Young Eco Socialist Caucus, well, it affects young people, it affects old people. I can think of some really ill-informed people who want, who would tell me, oh, but you're too young to have a disability, or, oh, you're, uh, you should have grown out of it. No, there is no age limit on having a disability. There are certainly disabled women. I myself am one. Uh, there are certainly disabled lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, queer, or oh, queer intersex, and asexual spectrum people. I fall under many parts of that spectrum myself as attendees of last night's panel I mentioned probably heard quite a bunch. Uh, and I'm trying to think if I left anybody. Oh, yes, the poor people, the foreign poor people's caucus. Well, unfortunately, we still live in a country where disabled people are economically discriminated against. Disability benefits often do not give enough money for people to be able to live with independence, dignity, be able to live on our own. Uh, I have a kind, loving family who are amazing. I should be able to choose whether to live with them or not based on 
my wishes and desires, not based upon whether Uncle Sam is willing to give me the money to live or not, which too often has been not the case. And uh, agencies, both state, local, and federal, must be brought to account and told, look, if somebody's on disability benefits because they cannot work a mainstream nine-to-five job, these agencies should not dangle services and independent living skills over our heads like dog treats uh, so that, you know, oh, you're not working? You don't get it? No, this should be a case of people are treated with, with equality, dignity, like full human beings. So that's why we have a disability caucus in this party, both to educate people with, well, a forming disability caucus, to educate people within the party about disability rights issues and how this impacts everybody. And also for the work that needs to be done outside this party, the fact that the corporate parties do not respect people with disabilities as often as they should or sometimes at all. We are the one party I know, which is one of the many reasons I am proud to have joined this party as the only party I have ever been in in my entire life. I'm proud that we have taken it upon ourselves, both at my local and at every other level I have witnessed in this party, to expand rights and dignity for, for disabled people, including disabled Greens. Uh, actually, since I've said a bunch about uh, the, the Lavender Caucus, uh, would you mind going next, David? Uh, that would be fine. I know I'm putting you on the spot, but I just said a whole mouthful about the caucus. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's great. Um, uh, I'm outside, so if folks will let me know if noises from the background get to be too much uh, and you can't hear me, that would be great. Um, I just noticed that somebody down the street started mowing their lawn, so. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I think that when I first became involved with so the first Green Gathering I ever attended was actually before the Green Party formed as it is now in uh, 8990. And I was invited by a cute guy from a neighboring college who I'd been dating. And I was amazed when I walked in the room and found all these people who were connected to all the movements that I had been involved in as an as a activist in the community, uh, including international solidarity movements, um, human rights movements, ecological movements, anti-racism, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, queer, two-spirit, Mahi rights, um, rights of um, animal rights, animal liberation, um, ecological sustainability, et cetera, et cetera. So this to me became a place that I felt at home and I became more involved after moving to Minnesota in 96 or 94, uh, worked on the first Nader Leduc campaign in 96 and um, here in Minnesota and volunteered on other local campaigns, uh, some of which were successful in 98. Um, and uh, we had further success then in 2000 with the Nader Leduc campaign that year and worked on more local campaigns, et cetera. So uh, that's a little bit of my history in the party. I first became involved at the national level um, through uh, in 2000, when I attended the national convention as a presidential nominating delegate, where I met Starlene Rankin, who was collecting signatures of a forming Lavender Green Caucus. And I don't even think we had the name down for sure at that point, but um, the intention was to be a home for the community um, with an expansive idea of what the community is since not, every, not everybody who is a woman who is attracted to other women or a man who's attracted to other men or somebody who's attracted to somebody who is neither are um, people who identify as say gay or lesbian or bi or trans, um, all these things are affected by intersections across race and ethnicity, um, history, 
and in historical ge geography, um, age cohort, um, a lot of people who are older generations, some were uncomfortable with the word queer, for example. Um, but we wanted to welcome people who identified under all these identities related to sexual orientation and gender diversity. Um, the caucus grew over the years. Uh, and um, obviously, uh, part of the reason we have an LGBTIQ caucus, around the time I, I first went to that first green gathering in, in 88, about 80% 80 of Americans thought same-sex relations should be illegal. It was the peak of that particular stigma. Um, largely, it had been in the 40s, in the 70s. It rose in the 80s with the conservative political wave, conservative social movements pressing forward. And in the, the fear of HIV and AIDS, um, obviously since then, a lot of progress has been made for, uh, rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, queer, two-spirit, asexual, intersex people. Um, notably in 2009 was the first time that there were any federal protections for sexual orientation and gender identity in hate crimes law. Uh, before then, crimes committed against sexual orientation and gender identity were not included in hate crimes law. And that was to some extent controversial in the community because one of the questions is, is incarceration the answer to this violence that's happening against the community? And there's a feeling that um, adding additional penalties is not necessarily what is wanted, all that people really, what people I don't want to say all, but what most people want is they want for when violence happens against the community and members of our community and the local police or state police refuse to take action, that there's some place to appeal to so that safe action can be taken. Um, uh, obviously, as you all are aware, a lot has changed. Um, marriage equality, um, acceptance into the military, and end of official discrimination in the federal government. Um, there still are uh, quite a few disparities, uh, even though um, the disparities widely impact different parts of the community differently. Uh, I have to say, um, moving to Minnesota uh, helped broaden my perspectives on a lot of these things. Minnesota was the second city in the country to have a gay rights law after Ann Arbor, Michigan uh, in 1970, uh, 1973. Uh, and we became the first city anywhere to have a transgender rights law, uh, a law that protected people against discrimination from gender identity, gender characteristics, or gender expression. Uh, discrimination on those bases in 1974. So here, those things have longly been part of how the community operates and exists and, is, it, and they are more understood and uh, the different parts of the community are more integrated. But just like not all the caucuses get along and share, um, obviously all these diverse ways of being that fall under lavender greens, um, we don't always all understand one another's issues. Um, and we spend a lot of time educating one another about one another's concerns um, so that we can all advocate for one another and have one another's backs. Um, I have to say that I haven't been able to be a part of this committee. Um, uh, yet, uh, this committee with the other caucuses, uh, because I just am returning to being involved at na the national level after taking a few years off to fin finally finish my college degree, going to school full time, working full time, and caring for aging parents. So, 
I'm very pleased to see this development uh, that has come about uh, because we do need to be talking with one another, even though LGBTIQA people are of all races and all, all ethnicities and disabled and elders and, and other, uh, you know, all genders. Um, we still, uh, we need to elevate uh, and understand one of those communities, our, the LGBTIQ community's particular history may lead us to take a particular position that might not come out of another caucus. Um, and conflict and difference in opinion um, is not violence. Conflict can be generative. Conflict is important to generating ways forward. Um, and being able to talk with one another is essential. Uh, so I guess with that, um, uh, I would like to pass to, um, not knowing everyone who, <laughs> since I was uh, a little late getting on the call, um, I'm gonna pass to Holly Hart from the Women's Caucus, uh, unless anybody has any specific questions. And I guess we're gonna have those later. Thank you. Holly? Hi, I am, uh, yes, thank you, thank you. And very interesting to hear of all these things. So um, I am here representing the National Women's Caucus um, formed quite a few years ago. And uh, just a little bit about the caucus. And one interesting thing I see in the chat, Gail Obler has noted how there's a mix of diversity and and in, uh, diversity and difference uh, and, and solidarity or, or inclusion in, in all these caucuses and women uh, it's an interesting thing because some of the most privileged people in society are women even the most privileged karen has some kind of oppression uh which is probably why she's so crabby but um but uh our group is the same way we were a mix of, of, of many you know white and most of us are not uh, upper class in terms of income but but more privileged women but also uh, those more marginalized, women of color, Black, Latinx, uh, poor women, women with disabilities, and trans women. And one of the things our group is, is driven to do is to be inclusive of all women, a mix of privilege and oppression, uh, how we can work together to uh, decrease marginalization for all of us, um, and be supportive of uh, women uh, always seeking education. And uh, some of the things we've done recently, and I want to thank, first of all, a shout out to our co-chairs currently. We have a number of uh, members here. In fact, uh, Dee Taylor and Ann Link, who are our co-chairs and have done a great deal of good organizing work, uh, helping to spiff up our website and make sure that our materials are, are there and available for people. I want to also thank other officers, uh, Starlene, Cynthia, Brian, Kate, and Tommy Yeager. And I know I'm leaving somebody out, but uh, sorry about that. But um, at any rate, uh, and of course, then our, our members who are not officers who are all, uh, always um, pitching in uh, with uh, interesting um, projects and things. Um, some of the things we've done, uh, we had a reading list. This is a couple of years old now, but we have a, a, an echo, so, uh, echo feminist reading list, which covers kind of a wide range of, of uh, what, might be, what might fall into that category, but that is available on our website. We've uh, put out some films we haven't produced them, but we've shown films. We've had uh, one called Push Out, which is a film about marginalization of black uh, school-age girls, uh, missing and disappeared indigenous women. And then we had a webinar, which I think Cynthia Bryan Kate may have helped present on uh, trans women. Uh, we've also, uh, the group has presented press conferences and workshops. The most recent was done at this uh, national meeting, Running for Change, moderated by Dr. Jill Stein, with a number of women candidates and uh, thanks to Ann Link for, for organizing that and putting it all together. We also do endorsements and promotion of women candidates. Uh, sometimes we're able to provide some funds, not a lot, but just you know a few bucks for women running for office. Um, uh, thanks DICD has put our website in the, in the um, chat room and I'm gonna put um, the rest of our stuff in there. Let's see if I can find this here. Um, go on. So there, if you go to our website and see, I'm, I'm also wearing our t-shirt. If you go to our website and you wanna join, you go to the page that has our great t-shirt on it, which you can get, anybody can wear them. Uh, and uh, you can also um, uh, find more information about uh, 
if you wanted to join that form is uh, the form builder is there that you can uh, use to join. Um, so we do the endorsements, promotional women candidates, and, and the donations is, uh, if, if we have funds. We're going to do that, I think, again this year. I think the next project is that we'll be reaching out to all women candidates running this year. And uh, we offer like an interview and an endorsement that they can put on their website. We can put on ours and kind of mutually help on each other. Um, I would ask, and I'm sorry because I don't have much more to say about this. I mean, part of... Um, Part of this is, I think, self-explanatory. We're um, very happy to have new members. And I will say that the, the caucus is actually, we've been um, pretty non-controversial inside the, I mean, people are pretty much, even when we've had um, uh, disagreements or, or people might be supporting different candidates or something for president, it's managed to come out in a very civil way. And I notice a lot of conversations that happened on the national committee, if they've come up in the women's committee or women's caucus, they come up with a different focus and it's it's just different. It's uh, different, uh, not necessarily more or less thoughtful, but it does tell me that women's voices are something that uh, it's important to include. It just gives a more variety and more uh, depth and insight into uh, in the way in the way that people are thinking of it and also in the way that we can uh, coexist with each other. Um, not that there haven't been little glitches along the way, but mostly uh, things have been, I, I think, quite, quite good in terms of civility and respect. Um, and uh, let me see, oh, Lisa Taylor, thank you. And Lisa's been a longtime member and, and supporter. And uh, again, one of the, the longtime members who have been very important voice in, in, uh, in maintaining our presence. Um, so I just, I don't have much more to say, but again, if you're interested, check out our website, check out our, our reading lists and our other activities. And most definitely, um, uh, if you wanna join, uh, again, we're open to all women and that does include trans women. There was a question about that. We made that clear. Uh, so we've got the form there uh, for people who would be interested. And um, we will see you in the next, um, see you online and at our next conference call and hopefully uh, uh, working on the next round of candidate support. And I will, I will mention if uh, Dee here uh, and Anna or Dee Taylor is here, if you have anything to add, because I could easily have left something out for what we just did last year because I wasn't um, paying as much of attention as I should. But um, If not, if not, I guess I'm finished with that. Of course, if there are any, I guess we're doing um, we're doing questions later. So let's see who's next. Um, mm, I don't. I know these people, but I don't know who to have. Let me see. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, oh, Daryl is not here yet, right? Um, well, let's go with um, with uh, Gail. Daryl is here. Okay. Um, well, I was, okay, yeah, let's, I, I see Daryl, Galen, Tyler, Jim Beckland, who else am I missing? Um, let's go with Galen Tyler, since he's next on my, my screen. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, if people can let me know if they hear me, I'm actually outside at a campsite and, um, been getting bad reception here and there as, uh, um, uh, Anita, can you hear me? You can just give me a thumbs up. You know what I mean? Y'all hear me pretty good? Okay, good. You know, um, it's good to see so many people here. I was just looking through and see so many people here. And that just kind of shows the importance of this council caucus that um, people really recognize and able to see. You know, diversity, you know, um, is something that's been very inclusive. You know what I mean? To us here, my name is, you know, I'm, I'm Galen Tyler and I work with the Poor People's Army uh, the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign. I've been doing that since the early 90s and it has progressed, you know what I mean, in a, in a number of different ways. And one of the things, you know what I mean, um, myself personally becoming a green in 2011 is because a lot of the issues that I was working on, you know what I mean, inside our organization, you know what I mean, the, the, the Green Party just lays it out point blank. Yeah, point blank, that be able to like, you know, what I mean, alleviate some of these issues and and put it in. And so I think, um, you know, when I look at all the different diversities and all the different caucuses, you know, it just makes so much sense for them to be able to have to sit down and interact with each other. Because I know from um, poor people's standpoint, you know, what I mean, we're at the bottom, and it's been very inclusive of all walks of life. Yeah, you know I mean, that hit, hit the rock bottom. You know what I mean? And so when I think of, um, you know, like 
you know, the women, you know what I mean, caucus, you know, I know we have poor women, you know what I mean, I know people will say, um, all the all the caucus are kind of mostly interchangeable. And that's why I think that they are so interchangeable that we do have to talk together and make sure that we all on the same page in relationship to speaking, you know what I mean, um, from the different diversities. And I, like I said, most of our, our, our different um, caucuses is very inclusive of other different diversities. And so it's just, it's just good for us to be able to constantly sit down and talk about these things. Um, I know the, the Poor People's Army um, has been working, like I said, with the Green Party since 2011, you know, and that's when we had a local member run as a Green Party candidate. And it was just like eye opening, you know what I mean, as far as poor people, because most poor people don't know about the Green Party. You know what I mean? The, um, the poor Green Party isn't in poor people's neighborhoods. You know, um, when I got there, it was predominantly, you know what I mean, elderly white, you know what I mean, um, whites, whether they was male or, or female, it was, you know, predominantly elderly whites. And then, you know, things started coming around, you know what I mean, with the diversity, you know, um, but it still always had like this hint of disconnection from the ground game, except for when it came down to collecting signatures for elections and stuff like that. Pride, like, you know, I'm just saying here in Philadelphia, you know, we've been constantly trying to push, you know what I mean, to get Green Party members to come out and interact in the neighborhood because we really think the, you know, the program is set up for poor, you know what I mean, low income and working class people. And it's just do they get a chance to hear what the program is? You know what I mean? Do they know about the 10 points? You know what I mean? The pillars, you know, those are the, those are the things that we think, you know, poor people that don't, aren't in the academic, you know what I mean? The activist world that aren't in politics like that, to be on the ground, to be able to hear about, um, you know, you know, the work that the Green Party is doing and trying to build and being independent and not just being an independent candidate, but being independent from the Democrats and the Republicans that have, you know, left, you know what I mean, the poor from all different diversities, you know what I mean, just, you know, um, pushed to the side and cast out of, you know what I mean, out of society. And so working with, um, you know, being able to sit down and express, you know what I mean, viewpoints, you know what I mean, because we know they're like like-minded people, you know what I mean, all these different caucuses. And so it's just, you know, it's just, so important, you know what I mean, for them to constantly and you know interchange, you know what I mean, activities, you know, inter, inter, interchange ideas, you know, keep passing them on, doing the each one teach one. When you hear stuff like me being a poor person, you know what I mean, yeah, I support transgender and stuff like that, but do I get a chance to hear constantly what they go through and what are some of the problems and the issues that I know that I can bring to the forefront of my, you know what I mean, organization and push that as well. And I think like this council caucus, you know what I mean, is a place where we can be able to like share these different diversities. And that's the same with like, you know, um, you know, all the other other different caucuses as well. You know, you know, it's just um I just would say because um I think when 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 in Philadelphia, when people raised it and they talked about it and it's been different people, you know, around the country, you know what I mean, has been on these calls, you know from an, an Anita, you know, um, also we had like, you know, Jackie, you know what I mean, and different people, Belinda, you know what I mean? You know, it was just in a number of different people who have been on it that's been trying to steer this, you know, coming from the diversity committee because the, the Poor People's Caucus is just forming right now. It's a lot of work that needs to be done, you know what I mean? And we, you know, um, caucuses that are already established, you know what I mean? You know, we wanna be reaching out to them to help us, you know what I mean, make sure we get ours established as well. And, you know, um, I'm just saying it's a good thing and I'm happy, you know, I'm, I'm you know, you know, I'm, I'm very worked in a whole lot of different places. Like I said, I'm right now at a campsite at a retreat, you know what I mean? But, you know, something like this is like super mad important, you know what I mean? And in and, and relationship to independent politics and making sure that it gets off the ground with all like-minded people being able to voice their, you know what I mean, have their voices heard, you know what I mean? And really come up with a collective, you know what I mean? Um, you know, decisions that, that, that everybody has like an input on, you know, and that could really move things forward. And so with that, I'll just pass it to Jim.
Thank you, Galen. I am uh, Jim Becklin. I am the co-chair of the Elders Caucus, and we are a forming caucus. Um, I would first want to thank the Council of Caucuses to put, for putting this together and allowing us to uh, be a part of it. Um, it's been quite an experience uh, being able to talk with all the other caucuses in an informal way. Um, get to know each other and work out some of the differences and finding out you know what people think uh, a, little, well, a little bit about the elders caucus of course we are in formation um, what we are doing um, is we are striving to bring the many years of Green Party activism and life experiences of its members to bear on critical struggles facing us today in our party, in our nation, and in the world. Um, we've lived the history of the Green Party. Many of us uh, have been uh, involved with the Green Party uh, over 20 years. In fact, uh, Jackie uh, and uh, D. Taylor, uh, who basically got the uh, Elders Caucus going, uh, have been around for quite a while. And I do appreciate them, the things that they've taught me. Um, one thing you can say is there's things that you can do to change your choices, your decisions. But one thing you can't do, you can't avoid getting old. Um, and the, be the best way that we know of finding out what would happen as we get older is to have the elders, not just of our party, um, but elders throughout the country uh, throughout the world, um, share our experiences. Um, we have uh, set up a list of different uh, topics that we, over the years, are going to be uh, addressing, uh, setting up um, position papers, hopefully doing some webinars, passing along our experiences. Um, Okay. Um, there, this is a lot of uh, kind of objections we've had from uh, of the uh, things with the that's going on with the accreditation process. Um, people think that just because there is a large number of elders who basically are in the high upper echelon of the, uh, of the Green Party, that we are represented very well. However, um, that's only a small minority of us. Um, There's so many of us in the, that are older, that are elders, that have had, had experiences that we need to share um, that really aren't getting a chance to share with everybody. So, and hopefully that we will be focusing on some of those things in the future. Um, another thing that I wanted to bring up here as far as the elders representation in the Green Party. Um, I was looking at the uh, platform of the Green, the recent platform of the Green Party, and I did notice only one reference to the elders. Let me read this to you. Um, yeah, there it is. This is from Part D: Welfare, a commitment to the end to ending poverty. And, it's, and, I, and it says, I quote, we must take an uncompromising position that the care and nurture of children 
elders and the disabled are essential to a healthy, peaceful, and sustainable society. That is the only reference in the entire GPUS platform on the elders. There are great big huge section on um, the youth caucus, um, but very little being said about us. Um, we are hoping that once we get formed or once we continue, which we will continue no matter what happens, that we can educate people, um, let our experiences be known, help the others out uh, of the caucuses, because we are a diverse caucus too. We have um, Latinx, Blacks, disabled, uh, LGBTQ people. Um, we are a very diverse group. So um, that's just about all I have. And again, thank you to the, uh, uh, the uh, Council of Caucuses for having us. And uh, thank you very much. And I think we have one more. Daryl, I'll pass it on to you. Well, thank you, Jim. So hello, everyone. And again, uh, I will express my thanks to all of you for being here, uh, along with everyone else that have done so. First, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So I joined the Green Party um, in the year that um, Cynthia McKinney became the nominee for president for the Green Party. Cynthia had been a uh, mentor of mine and worked with me. I worked with her in Georgia when I lived there and before leaving Georgia, uh, was preparing to run for state Senate or school board. And she was working with me and working through the process of where to go. I was actually preparing to run against a, um, um, I can't, a, a state senator who had been in office since the year I was born at that time. And we felt like, you know, well, he was not a bad, a horrible person generally. It was sort of time for some change. So, but I had a family situation. I moved and I left Georgia. And um, one of the things that Cynthia said to me, I mentioned this on another uh, workshop the other day, was that, you know, should take care of your family. That's your first priority. Uh, the Green Party, will, your, the, well, she didn't say Green Party, then the party will be here, politics will be here, and the need for change for our people will continue to be here. So you can jump back in at any time. And so ultimately, after my time going back to the West Coast, I moved back to, I moved to DC and uh, started getting involved here. I reached out actually quite a bit. This is, speaks to some of the reasons why this council is good and why our caucuses are good. Uh, no, Strom was somewhere else. He was in North Carolina somewhere, crazy place. But, um, but um, the, the, I, my initial engagement with the party was very, very, was, I wouldn't even call it lukewarm. It was just frigid. Um, I didn't get any response to um, emails. I left messages saying, hey, I'm a uh, mentee of Cynthia McKinney. I see she's the nominee. I want to work with her, work with the campaign, I, you know, all of that. Can you get me in touch with the campaign? Can you, you know, any of that? Just, I got nothing. Um, and then even with the local party um, here, uh, as we are continuing to rebuild our party and continue to work, it was, I signed up many times on lists and waited to, to be heard from. But a group of people in DC decided that they needed some candidates to run for office and they were looking and vetting candidates and I was one of the people that had been referred to them. They were an independent um, group of activists that wanted to get behind good candidates in the area. And so they selected me as a person to run for at large and we um, joined in with the DC, what is now what is known as the DC State of Green Party. The DC State of Green Party is a, um, a, a marriage between what was what the original DC statehood party that had been in existence for a really, really long time. And then uh, the newly created um, by, by um, uh, my good friend, Jennifer um, uh, Ellingson, they created the a Green Party in the DC Green Party, but the statehood party had ballot access. We had at one time had a council member and, um, but we have maintained our ballot access forever. 
Um, and uh, so they merged together and became the DC State of Green Party. So I'm also um, an activist, a consultant, a performer, a minister, um, a mental health specialist, trainer, and psycho have been a psychotherapist in my lifetime, working currently on my doctorate in uh, organizational leadership with a concentration in transformational leadership. And my study or my work is on uh, othering. And that deals with, to me, othering is the root of all the reasons why many of our caucuses exist in the first place. It is the root of racism, sexism, classism, homophobia, tran transphobia. It is the root of all those things that make someone the other and someone else the people who have power over the others. And um, it, so it, it's the root of that, that concept, that idea that somebody is other and therefore less than or someone is other and therefore better than. So um, those are some of the things that um, we, uh, that, that my study deals with. And um, I'm currently the chair of the DC State of Green Party um, and I have been off and on for a while. And um, why this council is important and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that and then about the National Black Caucus. The council, I think this council, this group is important as has been mentioned, it gives us an opportunity to share more conversations about intersectional areas where things overlap. Things are not so neat in politics. It's not just one set of things. There's so many ways that, that they overlap. So the issue of immigration is not a Latinx problem. It is a people of color problem. It is a poor people problem. It is an immigrant and an immigrant problem. It is a women's problem. It is a young people's problem, especially as young people who are being tortured or persecuted in wherever they're, where they may be coming from. Um, so these things matter across the board for all of us and for our ability to find ways to be in solidarity with each other, to talk about the areas where we differ or disagree, and to find ways to be in solidarity even when we differ. I think this serves as a model and can serve as a model for the larger Green Party. Uh, we don't do that so well. We don't do disagreements well. We don't do differences of, of thought and opinion. Um, we don't do education of people um, well in terms of people coming to an understanding um, of things that they may not have understood before. So, you know, one of the one of the arguments I have with people is that some people wake up and then they expect everyone else around them to be awake because they woke up, but you just woke up yesterday. How are you mad that other people are not yet awake, that they don't yet understand uh, the perspective that you're coming from or the issues that surround a particular subset of our community or of our, of our human family, um, they haven't woken up to that yet. Part of our work is to, to continue educating, waking them up. And I, that's what I do. That's everyone does not agree with me and I don't need them to. My work is to continue bringing people together and find ways to help people to understand across lines and across boundaries and across issues, how we're interconnected. And, um, and it is a yeoman's work. It is very difficult because people get stuck where they're stuck. But I think it's important that we do. I saw earlier in the chat some questions about the Indigenous Caucus and AAPI and uh, where there's been conversations in years past about a Muslim caucus. There's also conversations about immigrant and immigrant caucuses. So there are lots of other caucuses. The Youth Caucus, yes, has not been as active with the Council of Caucuses and we hope that we will be able to um, bridge the relationship and the gap there to, um, to bring all of the existing caucuses in and to make space for people who want to form a caucus um, and be able to have those conversations as well because I think that it is important that we're able, as I said earlier, to be able to stand in solidarity. Um, you know, the, the best way for me to describe the idea of solidarity is as a male, a cisgendered male bodied person. I can have a thought about abortion, but considering that this body is not ever gonna have to deal with it, I don't really need to have an opinion about it. My opinion is the women around me and the people around me for whom this is a matter that I take my lead from them that they get to, to, to lead in that, in that case. And my perspective about it, I can share and they can educate me more about if my perspective differs from theirs, but it needs to lead from, from them who, who the matter really impacts, right? And so I think that that's the lesson that we have to learn in our interconversation between caucuses and then within the Green Party as a whole, who these matters, um, are, are, are most um, centered around, we have to give room for those voices to lead. So the National Black Caucus, 
originally started as the Black Caucus. And as we um, began to grow in the last mm, five or six years or so, maybe a little more, we had uh, more states and locals creating state Black caucuses or local Black caucuses. And so we changed our name to the National Black Caucus to make room for the distinction between the um, large caucuses and the, the larger caucus of all of that and the other caucuses that existed. So we created or we renamed ourselves the National Black Caucus to create a little bit of distinction, but also give an umbrella space for state and local Black caucuses to have a home also to go to. And we are working on structures that will um, clarify more of that right now. But we work to advance Black issues in the Green Party and also engage Black people in the Green Party. We also work to ensure that the Green Party advances issues addressing Black people. So those are some great parts of who we are, our membership. Now, I will say, Alina mentioned earlier about the Latinx community, and I dare say this is true for all of our caucuses, but the, Na the National Black Caucus is no different. We are not a monolithic community. We are not always in complete agreement on every aspect of everything. We come from all over places with all different kinds of backgrounds and experiences, education levels, economic levels, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation. We are as diverse as the world. And uh, so we do not always agree on everything. And yes, we work through those and we try to do as much of that within ourselves and not let that spill over publicly. It's not a perfect um, world when that happens, but you know, when it spills over, it spills over and we deal with it. But uh, we really do try to work within the caucus to find consensus and find places of solidarity. Our membership is comprised of greens that are black um, or identify as black or African-American, but black because they may not all be, everyone doesn't identify who are black folks are not all African-American. Some are coming from somewhere else um, and identify differently, Afro-Caribbean, um, Afro-Latino, uh, Afro-Latinx rather. Um, so there are different ways that we, um, identify. Also, um, we have members, we have a unique situation. Our caucus has been toying with this and dealing with this and struggling with this um, for a little while now. We, our original founders created a mechanism for non-Black folk and others to, to be a part of the caucus, um, but they don't have voting status, but they can be a member. So we have an auxiliary membership or an affiliate membership status where non-Black Greens can be a part of our caucus and non-Green Black people can be a part of our caucus as well. So that if we are working on issues that are affecting the community, in our opinion, the best way to get more people in the, in the Green Party and to get more Black folks understanding that we are the party that represents them better is to be engaged with them. And one of the ways is to allow them to do the work with us, the work that we're doing in communities um, nationally or across the, um, the, the around the world or, or in, in local areas. We have monthly meetings and uh, we also, and they're usually right, and right now they're by Zoom, we do attempt when we are meeting face-to-face -to, -face to have an annual meeting at the annual national meeting when possible. Part of the challenge with that, of course, is that many of our folks are not always able to come to the national meeting. So we've had to make some changes in how we operate around that. Some of the major things we've been working on is a national Black agenda. Um, included in that Black agenda are issues are of reparations and international issues that affect Black people worldwide. Um, and so we are working to have as many of our members as they come in, as, as they get engaged, to uh, be a part of the members, the, the committees, and other and other other caucuses where they may find identity with, um, to be also have our voices shared in all those places. So that's the work that we're doing, work that we're building on. Um, I've been with the caucus since I joined the party, uh, and uh, it's been a, a a whirlwind of fun. I've also served as a co-chair. Uh, of the national party uh, steering committee member. And I have served on several committees as well um, within the national party structure al along with the work that I do at the state level. So uh, I'm very, very interested in continuing to grow us and to build our relationships across these lines, these artificial lines of distinction that have been created for us, race and class and gender and these things that are not all um, 
the, not all things, they're things that people created to create distinction, mostly for power, for, for power and, and privilege. So lots of stuff to unpack there, but um, I am pleased to be a part of this conversation and open to questions that any of you all might have for us. Our current of affiliate members um, have not been meeting with us and um, that's some internal stuff that we're dealing with and we do intend as a current culture of the National Black Caucus, one of my goals is to find a way to get our affiliate members to have some conversation so they can be in solidarity on issues that we are addressing. But we do have those members that we know about and we do reach out to them from time to time when there are things that are going on and we wanna make sure that they understand where we stand on certain issues and can support us and also give us feedback about what they're hearing in other parts of the party in regards to some of those issues. So I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you again for being here. And I'm hoping that this is gonna be a helpful conversation and that uh, this will grow and that this becomes a model for finding ways to uh, work through challenges within the larger party to get us to communicate better, to work more effectively and to grow up as a political party and not continue to act, um, you know, sort of like uh, political neophytes, not what we're doing and um, being politically immature, um, expecting, we don't, we're not gonna all agree. We should not even expect that, but we really should expect that we should find ways because there are reasons why we all came here. Something in our pillars, something in our values, something in our platform brought us all to this place. It may not be all of it, but some of it. And in those places, we should be able to find ways to work together and be together and then grow from there. So uh, if you are interested in reaching out to me, you can do so. I'm on the national list. Of my, my personal email is nubianphoenix1 at gmail.com. That's N-U-B-I-A-N. P-H-O-E-N-I-X, the number one at gmail.com, NubianPhoenix1 at gmail. And uh, we can chat, talk. And if you know candidates that are running for office that are black and brown, let us know so that we can connect with them. And if you, because here's the big problem that we've had is that the states don't tell us. We, have, we just found out about a, a candidate in Connecticut, but the, the states don't tend to tell us who people of color are or who black folks are in their state. Maybe some states don't have a way of collecting that data, but surely when you see a candidate and there's a picture, you can sort of ask them, hey, do you know about these, the caucus? Do you know about these other places that you might connect with? Um, and, uh, and that is not happening uh, in any way consistently. So it is a challenge to really make sure that we're touching and reaching out to people in the national party that are having struggles because racism, sexism, classism, homophobia, transphobia exist in the Green Party, surprise, surprise, um, because people come from their background and their experiences and they bring themselves to the party. So it's not a perfect place yet, but we can keep working for it. So I, I, this is probably my fifth time saying I'm gonna leave it there and this time I am, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you to all of the panelists um, for what you have presented today and the information you have provided. Um, so we're going to um, we're going to open it up to questions. And I did notice that there were a lot of um, there was a lot of dialogue taking on taking place on the chat, which which was really good in a way, but I'll, I'll also tell you that when I was speaking and having those pop up was very distracting to me. And, you know, at 68, sometimes it's a little tough for me to stay focused. And, um, but um, it, in any case, um, a, a good dialogue. And I also wanted to address some of the issues that had come up on that chat, um, in particular about who, who is not here. The Youth Caucus, did initially participate and um, they decided to stop participating. They were, they were not comfortable with everybody on, on the council at the time. Um, the door is open to them. We don't, we, you know, we don't make anybody participate. They can if they want to. Um, but I also want to say we also don't judge. If they have a reason for not, we respect that. And um, that's something for us to consider. It's what can we do? How can we grow? How can we make ourselves a better entity? And I hope that through continued dialogue, because just because they're not here 
in part as part of the caucus doesn't mean that they are not still our brothers and sisters in the Green Party. And we do still um, communicate and, you know, or some of us in some ways. Um, so, you know, hopefully um, their communication to us, although not really um, participating on, on a monthly basis, as we generally do, we'll, we'll continue. Um, we will take that seriously. We will not judge them for making the decisions that they make. We will respect those decisions and understand that it comes from a real place. We, we would not discount anybody's um, uh, feelings about this. Nonetheless, you know, we are all volunteers too. And we, you know, we come with our own um, agendas, which are strong agendas, which we have to have. We stand for the people who we feel um, we have to have their backs. So um, it, these are difficult conversations to have and they're important conversations to have. And we are on a road to figuring this out. We are not all the way there. So um, just to share that, as far as the Indigenous Caucus, we have reached out. I, I wanna say that um, they, are, um, they have not participated. We have been trying to, um, to see if there is somebody in that forming caucus um, that might want to participate. And as the diversity committee, which it, this, is a, this started out as a diversity committee pros, project, but it, not, it isn't anymore. It's a project of the caucuses. So um, we do want to um, reach out to the caucuses that are farming and see if we can't help them out. So I am going to open it up then to questions. And um, I will ask that people raise their hands if you have a question for all the panelists or a particular panelist. Any hands raised? Anita, if I may ask, um, are you looking for Zoom hands? Or uh, I just want to distinguish for folks, sometimes people will raise their hand Zoom on Zoom hands, please. Zoom hands, great. Anita, there was a question that was sent. I was trying to scroll back to the chat and someone asked a question of how, how we handle multi-ethnic issues inside the National Black Caucus. So let me answer that while people are raising their sure. hands. Um, so uh, if, you're black, if you identify as Black, do you identify as black? You, I am made up of a lot of cultures in my ancestral background, um, black, German, Jews, Irish, African, native indigenous as well. So, but I identify as black, that's my lived experience. And so um, I would not go to the indigenous group and say, hey, I'm an indigenous person. I would say I have some indigenous his heritage and I'm welcome to, in, in, to be involved if, they, if, if there's room. But I would not lead with that. Um, so if people are multi-ethnic, they are welcome to come and be a part of the caucus, if, especially if they identify as Black. Then, you know, this country has a, um, a history of racism that says you had a drop of Black blood, you were Black. So, hey, if it was good, then it's good now. So if you're Black, you're Black. Now, you know, the, the challenge that we do have are people that... Um, don't have a lived experience of being black, meaning people that may be multi-racial or multi-ethnic, but have not lived a black experience. And so they're bringing a different sensibility to the caucus or to their issues. And we, are, we don't want just people that wanna just come looky-loo, but wanna come and be about issues that are affecting our community. So we're open, we're welcome. And you know, it's a conversation that we have and you know, we, we don't really turn people away um, because of their multi-ethnicities or their multiple ethnic backgrounds, blah, blah, blah. Thank you, Daryl. Okay, so I do have a couple of hands raised. Um, uh, Felina Farley and Margaret Elizabeth, go ahead, Felina. Yeah, um, I know uh, some people might already know what I'm gonna say about, uh, well, it's not really bad. I, I just feels like we're we're kind of stretching the envelope when it comes to the definition of a caucus in the Green Party. And I do feel as though like now we're talking about poor people's caucus, labor caucuses, um, environmental caucus. And um, it seems like more and more we need to look into redefining the definition of caucus because it's, it's sprouting out from being underrepresented. 
um, in the party specifically compared to uh, the the true numbers of uh, disenfranchisement. So um, I, I prefer to be a, a senior council um, instead of caucus. And the reason for that is the, a council uh, has a more of a um, um, wisdom and, and guidance uh, nature to it versus focusing on the disenfranchisement of elderly. And um, I just, a lot of our cultures in um, black and brown communities were raised not to disenfranchise our elderly. They are our source of wisdom. And, you know, I don't want to perpetuate that stigma uh, against our elderly with the way we define caucuses in the party, not just the definition of caucus in general. And, um, you know, I also have a problem with, okay, they can do everything a caucus does, but recruit and endorse candidates in their demographic because that would be somewhat inappropriate because of the situation with overly representation of elderly in offices, in political offices, period, because we're a political party. So I would rather have a senior elders council that's just me. It's just better to just call it a council and and they can be in charge of a mentorship program and um, um, and keeping our archives, our Green Party archives in check because um, we lose a lot of information each time we lose one of the people that's been in the Green Party since the beginning and we lost a lot of members and a lot of our history went with it. So that was just my stigma of, do we want to put the, the caucus stigma of how we defined it on our elderly? On, on our elderly, that's my problem. So uh, <laughs> take it away you guys, but I would, I would definitely prefer as council, I really would. Um, this is Anita, and I'm just going to respond a little bit to some of your, your comments. One is it, caucuses cannot be created around issues such as the environment and things like that. that those are not um, uh, what? Those are not the kinds of things that create caucuses. Um, secondly, I, I would just share that um, I had had a good deal of ambivalence about the elders caucus as well but i joined the elders caucus and um i think that um because i see discrimination against the elderly in this party i, I see that i feel that i've been um you know i've been an activist in this um, party for over 20 years and yes i am treated differently because i am 68 and um the only way to remedy that is with a caucus that actually has the full rights and responsibilities of caucuses. So um, it, does anybody else on the panel, and I, I suppose I would call on Jim, since Jim is the representative from the Elders Caucus, if he wants to make a, a comment about that. And then I have a whole bunch of people with their hands up and I will, uh, as I said, Margaret Elizabeth is next. And does anybody else on the panel want to respond to uh, Felina? Mm -hmm. if, if you do, put your hand up. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so I'm... I will call on da Jim and then David. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, just, just briefly. Um, I guess the only thing I can say is, like I said before when I spoke, uh, even though uh, the kind of controlling factor of the Green Party are, you know, old white guys. Um, we as a group of elders are still underrepresented, underrepresented, um, the, the vast majority of us. Um, there are a lot of issues that uh, are not actually uh, being addressed by the party um, and the experiences that we have are not coming through. Uh, so that's about all I have to say on that. Okay, David and Daryl, did you wanna to respond to this question also? Yes. 
Okay, uh, David and then Daryl. Go ahead, David. Yeah, I, I guess I personally, uh, am I on? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I guess my perspective is that uh, there clearly is a marginalization of the elderly in our society, which is aside from their, the few who have lots of political power, lots of wealth. Uh, it's one of the reasons why during the presentation I asked about what the median wealth was rather than the average wealth of seniors, two very different figures, what most people experience um, and what some people experience. Uh, but I, I, I don't know if we're quite ready to, if the caucus is quite ready to be accredited or not. But I think that in the long term, it is a, a type of identity that historically has suffered and currently suffers various forms of marginalization. Um, but I think it's hard uh, for some people to see that. Um, uh, and I think that there needs to be a way to articulate that. And I don't know if it would be different if the age were higher. <laughs> but um, as far as the starting age, uh, but I don't know how that'll, that'll happen. But I, I think uh, in Minnesota, we had uh, two different types of, we called both caucuses, but they had different rights and responsibilities. We had identity caucuses and we also had we have, we have had identity caucuses and we also have had issue caucuses um, or focus caucuses and uh, both played vital roles in the party. So with that, I'll pass. Thank you, go ahead, Daryl. Yeah, uh, and I'm running out of battery on my iPad for some reason, so I might lose y'all partway through the last, these last few minutes we have. But really quickly, I, com I, I just think that, um, um, I like the conversation about these kinds of things, but I think that the um, it's when you get down to the question of um, not about the numbers of people that are involved, there's a whole bunch of women involved in the party and we have no problem with electing women to our positions in the party. We've had a treasurer forever and a new treasurer, both have been women and several of our treasurers have been women. It's not about that. It's about the political power that women have both in the party and outside of the party and what we're trying to work for. So in that sense, the same thing applies to the other identity caucuses, which include elders. So I fully support the idea of an elders caucus um, because of the marginalization of elders um, in both our society and within the work that we do. And uh, so, yeah, I think that that's important to be able to make those kinds of distinctions. And, um, and uh, yeah, I, I think and that I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, moving on, um, Margaret Elizabeth had their hand up for a long time. Go ahead, Margaret. Um, thank you, Anita. Thank you uh, to all the panel members for being here and for engaging in this discussion. I think it's really important to have, and I think it's it's an ongoing conversation that we should be having a bunch. We have a, a lot of intersecting identities and overlaps that allow us to have meaningful discussions about these things. So I'd like to kind of shift away from the Elders Caucus for just a second and ask a question that's sort of perhaps a softball question to David Strand, uh, the Lavender Caucus representative, and so <laughs> whatever. But David, I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit for for us, um, you know, in the party. So the Lavender Caucus is LGBTQIA+, plus, but plus is kind of like a lot, right? It's a plus sign. So I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate a little bit on like what the plus means in terms of being inclusive of other gender, sexual, and romantic minorities within the party and the caucus. Thank you. Well, well, there are maybe, depending on whether or not you are comfortable with trans being an umbrella, just like not everybody's comfortable with queer being an umbrella, there are at least, you know, that I know of a hundred and different, a hundred and some different ways to be gender different. Um, uh, I know people who are agender, I know people who are bigender, I know people who are um, obviously many people now, more people than identify as trans, identify as non-binary. Um, in the youngest generation, it's found that 2% of people identify as trans, the youngest adult generation, and 3% identify as non-binary, and 
24 to 27% identify as LGBTIQ to spirit plus <laughs> somewhere. Um, as far as uh, sexual orientation, um, pansexual, um, asexual, um, there are a variety of different ways of being different uh, in terms of sexual orientation. Uh, so that's a very diverse area as well. And then there's also um, queer is uh, sometimes interpreted. Uh, we have had a poly subcaucus. So uh, some people who are polyamorous uh, because their relationship practice is so different than the norm identify as being queer. Um, so there's a lot of differences that can be wrapped up um, in, in, in ways that people form families, in ways that people express their sexuality, in ways that people express their gender. And so um, I think uh, in the years when we were working on marriage equality, there was actually a lot of the caucus for whom that was not the priority. <laughs> and, um, you know, there's other, you know, working on gender affirming healthcare, there's large swaths of the gender diverse community for whom that is not the prime priority. Um, and yet it's critical for those people for whom it is. So um, we need a lot of alternatives to marriage for people whose chosen families that does not fit. We have in our platform that we root we defend the right to identify kinship, which coming from the queer community, often we form families with people or interdependent relationships with people who are not necessarily our romantic partners, um, sometimes because we're alienated from our family of origin um, due to homophobia, transphobia, et cetera, et cetera. So um, uh, I guess it does that sound like that kind of gives some idea yes it does thank you yep yes thank you david um okay so i have a bunch of people on the stack i have holly hart gil obler christopher vanderwall brown um daryl do you still want to be uh, called on or did you just not put down your hand i just didn't put it down Okay, then I have Craig Caetano, uh, Mary Sanders, Amy S, and Jackie Devino. So I'm gonna call on uh, folks in that order. Ho go ahead, Holly Hart. Uh, very quickly, and again, just a little bit um, out, out of, uh, out of um, uh, here, but, um, and I just wanna mention, Lisa, there's no such thing as a council. If we can guarantee a council, they wouldn't have voting rights, but I don't know that that's a big deal. But I wanna be really clear, there's nothing that drives me more nuts than, than focusing on internal representation and internal focus. And it is true that part of the reason this caucus for, or this council formed was because we wanted to have dialogue between the caucuses uh, for internal education, but also externally looking. The caucuses are formed not just as a haven or because the Green Party is so awful that we have to go and run and hide in our little groups, but they're to be reaching out. One of the first things one of our co-founders in the Women's Caucus did was contact now other national women's organizations we want to be out there saying, here's what the Green Party has to offer. Support our green candidates. Here's, here's what we want you to steal from our platform. So I want to be very clear about this because a lot of this talk and when there's, and I, I will say, I think some people might realize there's some contrived controversies going on um, that, they're, that have, have created some issues that I think are, are definitely surmountable, but I mean, not insurmountable. But I think that the, I, want to, I want us to keep clear on the fact that the real purpose of these caucuses are partly for networking and support, but mainly to be reaching out to the rest of the community. We have things that can, we can offer the community. All of our groups have um, policies that we've uh, promoted or developed that we'd like society at large to, to adopt. So, um, you know, if, if the more we focus inward, I think the less effective we all are. So I just wanted to bring that out there and make sure that people understand that that was really the important thing not how much, as, as Daryl mentioned, there are, women are the majority. You know, we could, we could have a majority of, of, of seats inside the Green Party and still have issues. And um, I'm not sure that anyone's really counted to see how many of what demographic are, are holding those seats. But um, I, and I also, having worked in fundraising 
in radio fundraising, there's this idea that competition means that fewer people get more money, but really the more people that are involved, the bigger the pie gets. So we can expand and, and accommodate more people over. Okay, thank you, Holly. Um, Gil, Gil Obler. Yeah, I just, uh, I wanted to say, uh, um, first of all, that the, I think the party made the right decision centering the caucuses um, around amplifying the voiceless. And I think that's still the correct um, approach. Um, um, you know, obviously uh, many of us support uh, some of the forming caucuses um, and there are issues with, with others. Um, but I also know, I mean, I think the, the council and the caucuses are really wonderful um, because precisely because um, we can have disagreement and dialogue um, while maintaining solidarity and respect. Um, and, um, and I think that's a strength of what, what the council and what the caucuses represent. Um, so I, I also wanna be respectful and, and really, even though I support the Elders Caucus, for instance, um, you know, I, I, think, I think Felina raises um, legitimate concerns that we should figure out how to address. Um, uh, and just as an example, how the party confronts redlining and gerrymandering um, while not maintaining the mission of the caucuses. Um, so I think those are things worth discussing further in another forum and working through. Um, and I just wish the national party um, had shared that culture that we're promoting here. Thank you. Thank you, Gil. Okay, Christopher. Yes, um, I had a two part question. The first part of my question was related to the Elder Caucus. Um, as uh, Daryl had mentioned for the Black Caucus, the ability to have um, ancillary members that don't have voting rights that are um, people in the community who either are allies or who have some connection to it. In the case of the Elder Caucus, I know for myself and my family, I have had to be involved in the Elder community and aspects of it that have been incredibly disenfranchised. It was wondering how the caucus was going to be set up in regards to those of us who um, participate. And the other is, um, as a millennial, somebody who is sort of on this cusp edge situation, um, I'm, I guess I'm wondering how I can help um, a, a foster a dialogue um, with those who I may understand better because uh, I am closer to them in age and, and uh, socioeconomic status. Okay, who from our panel would like to respond to that? Okay, so I, I will just um, take a stab at it. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um... If I'm, I'm trying to teach through your question, Christopher, and I think at the end of the day, all of the caucuses have opportunities for allies to engage with them on issues that that caucus is working on. I don't know that I uh, we agree necessarily that we need to, that every caucus should have a sub group that have membership in the caucus to in order to be able to be an ally. Um, I'm I've not pushed to remove that from my caucus, but others have wanted to remove that from the caucus for various reasons, but I'm not sure that it is a necessary avenue. I think what we should do is that caucuses should have a way of communicating their needs and their issues with their allies and building relationships with their allies so that they have opportunities to engage with each other. And that's more important than what than what membership status you have in the caucus, but how do we continue to communicate across our different ways and across our issues to find intersectionality and to, to engage allies on issues? We, we would hope that everybody in the party would be allies with all of us, but that's we know that, they, that that ain't true. So how do we engage our allies? Because um, you know some of our folks that would be in our caucus are not people that are in our caucus because they don't agree with us with the caucus. So you know, and not all of us who look like each other, or act like each other, do what we do, will be together with each other. So that's my thought, and I, I'm slowly losing power. So we'll see what happens. I love, I'm blasting here. Okay, thank you, um, David. Did you want to respond to that also, David Strand?
not hearing. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, uh, I think the I think it is an interesting question for all the caucuses, really. In some cases, um, I think the value of having an elder caucus would be. I find a value. I have represented my state party on the national committee, and I have rep represented the Lavender Green Caucus on the national committee. When I represent my state party, I'm representing a completely different set of people, interests, and, and so forth and so on. And yet when I'm at the table as the Lavender Green representative, it's important to have somebody at the table who's looking out for those ways that something that comes up impacts people who are part of my community because often people don't think about how a given policy might impact people in my community and less of my community is able to communicate that and have somebody who speaks for that marginalized population. So I think part of the value of having the caucuses is that having somebody at the table whose specific job is to represent the marginalized whatever that marginalization is. And it doesn't always manifest in economic terms. There are various kinds of manifestation, uh, manifestations of the results of discrimination, uh, marginalization. Um, and I think that it's really important that we not um, decide that some group is inherently not marginalized um, for reasons that some groups, many groups, it's very clear. And, uh, and I think there are arguments with the elders that that's clear as well. Um, okay. As far as the allies situation, I just wanted to say really quickly um, that like, for instance, we have some mothers, I've been contacted by mothers of trans kids who are seeking you know, they're having trouble getting health care in Texas. So is that somebody who should be able to communicate with the caucus, even though they themselves is not part of the caucus? Okay. Oh, what you mean? Which caucus are you talking about? You mean the elderly caucus or the, well, I'm, okay, I'm okay, okay. Wait, wait, wait. We're going to go okay. by stack here. Well, and, I'm, sorry, I um, it. I'm sorry, I heard my name, sorry. Um, okay, no. Um, so I think David was done. Um, and this is a question for Michael O'Neill at this point. We are over time, Michael. And I know that there is something else coming up. And um, we have several people still on the stack. I'd like to go through the stack through Randy. Um, do we have enough time to do that, Michael? Anita, the next session is committee reports. Uh, and that starts at 1.45 p.m. So, so that's uh, coming up really soon. Yep, and it's in, in this exact same meeting. Um, so people can stay on for that or go on mute or, and turn off their camera to take a, a break if they want. Um, but we, we don't need to shut down the Zoom meeting. Uh, so up to you if you wanna go. Uh, but the people running the community reports might need some time to- Set up. Uh, yeah, set up. Yeah, so I would say, you know, three to five minutes at the most, probably closer okay. to three. Um, so I'm going to call on the, the next person. Unfortunately, that has to be the last person, and that's Craig Caetano. And um, then we have to wrap it up. Go ahead, Craig. Thank you. Uh, so I've, uh, I'm trying to think of housekeeping stuff real quick. So I think the website uh, is great, but I think we need to do a little housekeeping because I'm, I'm worried about the data for a lot of these uh, contacts coming to the party. I've always interpreted a caucus as a, a first step to the party. People are just learning about the Green Party and they wanna get involved. And then that information gets disseminated out to the state parties. I was hoping that I would see something about the uh, Disability Caucus, the uh, uh, Indigenous Caucus on our website because I know we've been working for years to get the data, the people, the information together. I think if we had a landing page for these potential caucuses, elder caucuses as well, that would help. And then obviously the party, main party website controls the information and then can funnel that down 
to the appropriate caucus or to the state parties as well. Um, so I'm hoping we can get a little housekeeping done on that end. And uh, I, I think the committees need to have a little better labeling on the website as well. I know we're under take action, but take action has a lot of categories. I almost would love to see register and volunteer as its own sub category and then just committees and actions as a separate one, because I think you have so much buried. A lot of people kind of get lost on our website and like people aren't aware we have an eco action committee. How do you become a member? How do you get involved? Obviously you have to be appointed by the state party, but I think everybody's gotta be aware that there's some stuff that needs to be uh, addressed that way and over. Thank you, very good suggestions. And my apologies to the rest of the people who have their hands up, but time is out. Um, a wonderful discussion. Thank you to all of you for, um, for coming. And um, my, my information, my contact information is out there. If you need anything, please reach out to me. I will get you whatever information I can dig up from any place. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks for putting Thank this you. on. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. for coming out. Thank, Thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Anita. Yeah, sure as hell like to know what will be next. Thanks, Michael. Bye-bye.